Hello. Thanks for joining the Weave user group. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, we will have Abby, our guest speaker, join in a second. Abby, can you turn on your video and microphone? Hi. It is. Great. We're so lucky to have um, Abby here as our guest speaker. And it's great to also see a lot of our regular users joining back for a new talk. So thanks so much for um, watching our show. So uh, today, Abby will spend the first half of this um, user group, which is an hour, or a little less than an hour. I'm talking about an introduction to microservices um, on AWS perspective. So it's sort of best practices for microservices from Abby's great experience, um, especially for her new role at AWS. And this is actually a two part series. So um, she'll have some content that she's covering this time and then she'll be coming back again because we're very lucky to have her twice um, in exactly four weeks on March 28th uh, for the second half of this. So with that, um, I will Hopefully everybody can see my slides. Um, just an overview, um, Luke will also be coming in uh, for the second half um, with time permitting. So if you have tons of questions for Abby, you know, uh, go ahead and, and ask as many as you can. Um, if we feel satisfied with the conversation and have a little time, Luke will talk about Weave Scope, which is one of our great open source projects that helps you visualize um, your container environments. If you missed a little intro, my name is Abby Fuller. I am a technical evangelist with AWS, which is a fancy way of saying that I am a software engineer that just talks about stuff now. Uh, before I joined AWS, uh, I worked as an ops engineer at a bunch of startups, so uh, Airtime and Halo and, and places like that. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit of basics about how we look at microservices at AWS. Um, should be really quick, maybe 20 minutes, and then uh, if people have questions at the end, um, we, can, we can chat about them, and then there will be, as Tamara said, uh, a follow-up follow session to this. So um, if you have anything specific that you want to see us cover next time, uh, let me know. Cool. Awesome. So what we're going to cover. So what are microservices and maybe what are some of the reasons that companies are adopting them? Uh, we'll look a little bit at monolith to microservices uh, and then we're going to cover some really high level best practices for microservices and then we'll cover questions at the end. Um, what we're not going to cover this time is language specific things or uh, specific, really specific use cases on AWS and I think we can get more into the specifics uh, next time. So. Uh, really basics, what's a microservice? So microservices are a service-oriented architecture composed of loosely coupled elements that have bounded contexts. Um, and this used to be our, apparently our coolest customer example. This is Adrian Cockroft, uh, who used to be the cloud architect at Netflix, uh, and now he works for, <laughs> for AWS also. Um, so what does this mean? So we can break this down a little bit. So service-oriented architecture means that services communicate with each other over the network with a specific, um, loosely coupled. So this is actually what, what, I, what I think is one of the most important parts here. Uh, and that's that I can update each service independently and changing one service does not require changing any other service. And I think that's actually, that's my most important microservices thing is that I can, I can change one, but it doesn't mean that I have to change everything else. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means for the architecture later on. Um, and what bounded context, so self-contained. I can update the code of one service without knowing anything about the internals of another service. And uh, I think this really segues us into why companies are adopting microservices in the first place. So we talked a little about bounded context and separation. Uh, in a lot of cases, that gets us a faster pace of feature delivery. It separates that services out so that I don't need to know how uh, someone else's service works in order to effectively work on my service. Uh, and it increases developer velocity. So if I don't have to know anything about the internals of another service to work on one service, and I can make changes just to my loosely coupled service just on my own, uh, that lets me work really quickly because I don't really have, I don't have to have this background knowledge about this huge monolith in order to change just the one part that I wanna work with. Um, so monolith to microservices. Um, I think that I'm gonna do something a little different, I guess, and start off 
with some of the, with some negatives. Um, you hear, I think, a lot of cool Medium blog posts. I was one of the people that wrote one of those about, oh, so we had this really old monolith and we broke it down and we decomposed it into microservices. Uh, and that is so true. And for a lot of cases, that works really well. Um, what that does mean, and what I don't always see us cover, is that there are some challenges that go along with decomposing from your monolith to your microservices. So some of the big ones, service discovery is huge. You get a lot more moving parts, which we'll cover a little bit later. It adds a little bit more complexity to test, to deploy, to operate. And you have a cultural transformation that we're going to cover a little bit later, but it's not just an architecture transformation. It also, you have to change how your teams work and how you guys solve problems as you go. Um, when you, so if you do want to use microservices, so say you've looked at all these challenges, you've looked at your architecture and you said, okay, you know what, this is the right, this is the right architecture decision for me. Uh, a couple of best practices, and these are, these are my opinions on the best practices. I think everyone kind of has what works for them, but in general, we found that these are some of the big ones. So we're going to summarize them all, and then we're going to go into really into some detail afterwards. Uh, number one, rely on the public API. Uh, you need to use the right tool for the job. Uh, you have to secure your services. You need to be a good microservices citizen. Uh, you need to account for organizational changes and automation over everything, which, I mean, obviously, where possible. Um, cool. So uh, rely on the public API. Um, so this is our, my little microservices diagram. Basically, your services should only talk to each other via the public API. So you shouldn't talk directly to the database from one microservice, from microservice A to microservice B. I shouldn't talk directly to that database. You should hide and replicate your data. Um, another thing, that, so APIs are a contract and you support them for the lifetime of the service. So you have to evaluate your API in a backwards compatible way and document everything. So that means semantic versioning. Um, if you don't know a whole lot about this, you can find a bunch more online, but basically you need a good versioning strategy. So uh, a major change is a version when you make incompatible API changes so that I cannot I cannot use one version of an API with the other version. Uh, minor, when I add functionality in a backwards compatible way, and a patch is when I make a backwards compatible bug facing issue. Um, here's an example of what that might look like for our fake uh, restaurant API service that we made. But ultimately the goal here is that if I have a service A and I have service B, I should, never, I should only ever go through that public facing API. Um, and that means using the right tool for the job and every job. So we might have microservice A talking to B using DynamoDB. Uh, we might be using Dynamo and Elasticsearch. Uh, we might use RDS and Elasticsearch. We might use Java, we might use Node. Um, ultimately, use the right tool that fits your business need right then. And with microservices, it doesn't necessarily need to matter since they're just talking via the API. It shouldn't matter that your whole stack uses Node or all of your services use RDS or all of your services use Elasticsearch. They're just talking via the public API. So each service can individually use the tools that are right for it. Um, secure your services. Um, I think that this is, you could probably do, you could probably do a whole, a whole webinar on all of these individually, but we're going to cover just some really high level stuff. So security is, is, it's obviously huge and there's, there's a lot more specifics going to here, but basically you have to have, you have to, you have to have defense at every level. So you want to have your network level. So in Amazon, that would be a VPC or your security group. Um, you get them at the server and container level. You get them at the app level. Um, AWS uses the concept of IAM roles, which, so a popular way right now of running microservices on AWS is through ECS. Um, so for an, exa an example on ECS might be that I'm using IAM roles uh, both for the actual users, but then I'm using the service level and then task level IAM roles also. Um, client to service. So basically authenticate and authorize wherever you can. So manage your secrets securely, uh, add API throttling so that if someone's up to no good, you can make sure that you stop them. Um, use token based, IAM based. We talked about IAM based. Basically keep your services secure. Uh, make sure that things only talk to other services where they need to. And you give everyone the least amount of privilege possible. So if I'm running, uh, 
if I'm running a, a sign up form on a website, it probably doesn't need access to like an internal customer database. Uh, so give things only access to the services and the data that they need access to. Um, being a, micro, a good microservices citizen. So this is a little bit, this is a little bit more vague, but it goes both ways. So service owners have a responsibility. So you publish your health, you monitor your services, and clients have a responsibility to do proper retries with exponential back off. So here's a little example of a, of a fake talk that I guess could have had little people on it, but service one is saying, hey Sally, we need to call your microservices to fetch restaurant details. And Sally says, because she has a responsibility also, sure Paul, which APIs do you need to call? Once I know your use case, I'll give you permission to register as a client. So this is just saying, hey, I'm asking for access. And then just as we talked about securing our services before, um, the second service is saying, okay, but which APIs exactly do you need access to? So I'm only gonna give you access to only what you need, and then I'll give you permission once I know a little bit more about what you're looking for. Um, so this is just more about expected use cases. So I wanna know about what you're trying to do with my service and have clear SLAs before I give you access. Um, we talked a little bit about how both sides, uh, both sides have a responsibility. And basically, if it moves, it should be tracked and logged. So spend more time working on code that analyzes the meaning of metrics uh, than code that collects, moves, stores, and displays data. Um, Fit your metrics to models so that you can order, so that you can understand relationships better. Um, basically, you want to have monitoring and tracing and logging for everything that you can possibly can. So there's tools in Amazon to help you do that, but there's a bunch of third-party ones also. Um, this is really important. Um, you can uh, you can optimize and improve and, and and improve your system so much better if you have all the data that's necessary to kind of look at what's happening. Um, so accounting for organizational changes. So uh, a lot of people use an example here called Conway's Law, and that's any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So it's all about communication between teams, and it's not just about changing the software architecture, but it's also changing the way that the teams are organized. So uh, siloed teams lead to siloed architecture. So if I have my group of UI specialists and my group of middleware specialists and my group of DBAs, that all leads to working. People just do what they have experience doing. So you have your UI specialists that are only working on the UI and they're not focused on anything else. And middleware is only focused on the middleware. The DBAs are only focused on the database. Uh, and with microservices, that doesn't really work. So what you need is you need cross-functional teams that will lead to self-contained services. So if you, split your, you, if you split your teams into services that are organized around business capability, so you might get a broad stack of software for a business section, I don't know, so like accounting. So that includes our user interface, it includes our persistent storage, it includes any external collaboration. So what you end up with are teams that are cross-functional. So they include the full range of skills needed to work on that on that product. So user experience to database to product management. So you can split that out into a number of individual services that communicate via messaging. So you're focusing on a product and not a project. Um, so the way that we look at this at Amazon, it's something called two pizza teams. Um, the team should be no bigger than what can have two pizzas. Um, and what it really, just like a silly way I think of looking into it, but so that, that means that the biggest team that you could possibly have is eight people. And that's a cultural change. So it means that you have to have small teams with full autonomy, uh, feels like small startups. So you work directly with customers, you set a roadmap, you design their features, you write code, you design their own tests, you deploy to production. Um, if there's pain in your service and your process, you can't pass it off to another team and say, oh, well, I don't know, ops, this whole deployment process isn't great. You have full ownership, full accountability, and you have aligned incentives across your whole team. Um, so we did, we made a company goal to kind of devolve our monolith a while ago also. And part of that was changing some of the organizational structure. So breaking it down into these little teams, the two pizza teams, um, 
that accountability works really well for microservices because I can kind of own the whole process from start to finish. And you end up with what I feel something is, is way more effective because there's no more uh, that, that concept of throw it over the wall. So I write my code, but then QA worries about testing it. And then ops worries about deploying that. When you have these really small cross-functional teams, you own that whole process. So you're responsible you're responsible for every piece of it and it ends up being a better process because of it. Um, finally, automate where possible. Um, so there are tools, like with anything else, there's tools to help you do it. So code commit or code pipeline or code deploy. But ultimately, there's a lot more moving pieces that happen with microservices. So previously, you had one monolith to deploy or you had you know, a couple bigger apps and you can't really do that anymore. So you might end up with, 50, 100, 75, 200 services. And that's a lot more moving pieces. That's a lot more orchestration. Uh, so you want to automate for consistency and for ease of deployment. So if you can make it so that, okay, I build my service, I test it, I push it to, uh, to GitHub, it runs more tests and then it deploys itself automatically. That's huge if you're deploying five or 10 times a day instead of once every couple of weeks. Um, so if there are any questions, I can take questions now. Um, if you have anything specific that you want us to cover next time, um, you can let me know either now or you can tweet at one of us later. Um, what the goal is for next time is to cover some of these in more detail. So a little bit more about how you can run uh, a microservices architecture on AWS uh, and some tools that will be out there to help you do it. Um, and then we can, we can talk about some more specific use cases cases also. Um, cool. So any questions? So one I question. I see the little flashing orange thing, yes. but I couldn't actually see the questions. Okay. <laughs> I have one. Um, are you going to talk about service discovery? Yeah. Um, so I think service discovery is, is one of those things where it depends on it depends on what your actual architecture is going to be. What I think has been where I'm seeing people kind of look at service discovery with AWS has been with, with ECS. Um, so people running these container based microservices architecture on ECS. And previously it was, it was like, a, it was a little funky. So I saw a lot of people. So what I did before I joined Amazon is I did service discovery through the ELB. Um, so each new service registered with a load balancer and then I could talk to services or distri uh, distribute my requests via the load balancer. Um, what I think is really interesting though now is the application load balancer. So rather than deal with spinning up a new uh, load balancer classic with every new service, which is a little, which is a little funky. And some people I think have used etcd for service discovery. Um, I, I like doing the ALB where basically I'm just adding a new target group for every, for every new service that I add to my architecture on ECS, I can add a new target group. Uh, so I can theoretically, I can just do services, service, service discovery through the load balancer. So instead of having 10, 15, 20 different ELBs, I have one ALB and I route traffic uh, based on the endpoint. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to do it. If people are interested in looking at kind of a diff couple couple of different examples of, of service discovery. We can also talk about a couple, we can look at a couple specific examples next time. Cool. So I have another question. What is your opinion about shared libraries between microservices? Um, so that's a harder question, I think. So yes, I think, so I look at microservices from the container perspective and I generally think that the, the the best part of the of a container and a container based microservice is that it has everything that it already needs. I don't have to want to have to worry about a shared library is fine. But as long as the end result is that my container has everything that it needs to be deployed somewhere. I don't want to have to be worrying about like, Oh, can I pull this at run? Can I pull this at boot? Can I pull this from another service running? Those services should only be communicating via their public API and each service or each container should already contain everything it needs. It should be an atomic piece that doesn't rely on anything else. It can communicate as a client and it can communicate via messaging, but it shouldn't rely on anything else. So, 
Um, so we also have another question. What orchestration services does ECS support? Kubernetes, Swarm, other? And then in addition to that, why choose one over the other? Um, cool. So I think the first, I think I'm going to address this a little bit backwards. And the first one that I keep, it's a kind of a question that keeps coming up in different, many shapes and forms. But what the thing that I'm going to address first, I guess, is that so ECS is just, ECS is just on EC2. It's a clever layer on top of EC2, but ultimately like EC2 is still just EC2. And you can, you, can, you can run whatever you want. Those servers are yours. You could write your own schedule or your own orchestration service, I guess, if you were a, a glutton for punishment. Um, so ECS is doing its own orchestration. You could, AWS, you can run Kubernetes or Swarm on, and I think, that's something that we maybe need to do a better job of, of addressing is maybe some best practices. And I've gotten a lot of interest maybe for, for talking about some best practices and how to run uh, Kubernetes on AWS. Um, but ECS is its own orchestration service. Uh, alternatively, we have something called Blocks. Um, so that is kind of our open source suite of tools around ECS. Um, so you can extend the functionality of ECS through Blocks. Uh, but ECS is its own orchestration service, but it's built on top of regular EC2 instances um, where you can use whichever orchestration uh, service you'd like. Awesome. Are there any other questions? We also have here, um, so Luke has joined. We'll be talking about scope in a bit. Um, and Ilya, one of our dev advocates has joined as well. Do any of you guys have questions for Abby in terms of, not to put you on the spot, but any kind of, best practices for uh, microservices on AWS. I also saw something about uh, looking for slides afterwards, and I'm, I'm not, are you, if you guys are planning on making the slides available, but uh, yes, yeah. I have no issue with it. So okay. if you want to pass them out, that's fine. Yeah. So um, Abby, I know you're fairly new at AWS, but um, have you already had some customer conversations, obviously without mentioning any of the customers, but have you noticed any trends um, that might have surprised you that are different from your personal experience. You know, obviously this space is just changing so rapidly. Yeah. Um, I think my, my single kind of biggest surprise, which I think I've, I've been working pretty hard to change in my first couple of months here is um, I'm seeing a lot of people that are missing kind of that fundamental, the change in architecture that it's not, I can't just take my monolith and chop it up into a bunch of pieces and call it microservices. I can't stick an ex or I could, but I'd be upset. I could stay. I can't stick my existing monolith into a container and then also call it a day. None of those are going to lead to you being having a successful kind of microservices architecture. So I think what's been really interesting, which I think is, is easier to solve maybe than what I was expecting to have to solve um, is that people, it's still just a really new space and people are interested in it. And there's an incredible amount of resources and community conversation, which is awesome. That's happening kind of around containers and microservices and how can I use this effectively? Um, and what I think was kind of missing is the, the, the first step, which is, okay, so you've decided that this is the right tool for you and you've picked some of the right infrastructure that you want to use. Here's, Here's how to actually go about doing it. Here's some things that you want to think about when you're breaking up your big monolith into all these little pieces. Here's how to write a smart app in a container. Here's how to just set something up on ECS and then talk about how to start decomposing your service. I think actually it's been really interesting to kind of see what people are what, what people are, are running into when they're first getting started. And it's not necessarily that it's that they, they know containers are cool and they know microservices are cool and they ha there's an incredible willingness there to kind of try it out and adopt new things. But that, that fundamental first piece is there, which is that how do I do this right? Um, but um, I think it's, it's an easier one to solve because we can just get the community to share their data too because ultimately what I want to hear from as a developer is, okay, well, you're a developer somewhere else and you did this successfully and your architecture is awesome so I can learn from you rather than just kind of stumbling through the fact that I myself. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, we have a few others. Um, one of the challenges with services is data volumes. Any best practices on that? Um, so 
that and the next question, I think my, my caveat for both of those is that my approach to containers has always been, if it's data that I care about and I want it to reliably persist, um, the container has never been the right place for that for me. That what I, when I think about containers or when I think about my, my cluster servers, I don't think of them as being entities that stay around all the time. And I feel like my big preaching point before I got here, which I guess is still my thing, is that I want my servers to be cattle and not pets. So I don't wanna to have to worry that if I don't keep server B around, all of my customer data from yesterday between 8 p.m. and midnight will be lost. I don't wanna to have to worry about that. If I have data that's important, so log files or customer data or updates or something like that, what, I gen what I've done in the past is I just want that somewhere else. There are places that are much smarter for storing my data than a container or even the host on which my container runs because I'm not expecting them to really have much of a life cycle. I wanna be able to spin up, scale down, terminate and replace instances in my cluster as fast as I need to. I wanna be able to scale up to meet traffic and I wanna be able to scale back down again just as quickly. And I don't wanna to have to care about which instances I terminate to do that. Um, and I don't want to have to worry too much about setting them up either. So if I scale up a new instance, I don't really want to have to fuss about with it. I want to just say, okay, this auto scales. And if a container gets data that it needs, if the service collects data, I generally feel that the best place for data is in a database or in a cache or somewhere that's not a container because I want to be able to terminate my containers. Um, that said, uh, not the first person to ask about about data volumes. Um, something that I think is cool from the EC2 side, um, we, we do have those, those data volumes. Um, I'd be interested in seeing something like that at the container level, I think it would be interesting. Um, don't know what the future holds, uh, not the first person to ask that question. My best practice recommendation is to put it in a database and to keep it somewhere else. And that if, you're, if, both, if both services need to talk, need to, need to get that data, uh, do it through the service layer. So save, save the data to the database and then collect it through a service. Um, but that's a personal thing. I'm sure that there are lots of crazy and clever people doing smart things with data volumes. You can't mount volumes, by the way, in ECS. So like, I mean, Docker lets you mount data volumes. It's not my cup of T for the kind of architectures that I was building, but like that is a that is a part of Docker. So you can mount data volumes to containers in Docker. Yeah, and you could use them with ZFS, for example, if you really have to run a database within your cluster, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I had a different question actually. I was wondering, um, I was wondering, what, what do you see people do around continuous delivery on ECS? Uh, how do people implement that? I mean, I've seen I've seen some of the examples that are open source on GitHub, like. Uh, what the sky scanner folks did but that doesn't give quite a complete picture so i'm just trying to wonder uh try, trying to work out how um, how people tend to do that these days or uh, or is there anything that people do or uh, it's kind of you know they, they write custom schedulers or such things so what do they do um so i was not in the business of writing my own custom continuous delivery thing because that seems like way more way more work than this lazy ops person was willing to do um I, I used a company called um, Circle CI. So we tried a bunch of them and ultimately we ended up using Circle that basically I built and pushed locally um, and then uh, I ran my tests on Circle CI and then if my tests passed on Circle CI, I made an API call to ECS uh, to update and register my new test definition. So I feel like it was kind of half and half. It definitely involved me writing some stuff to do to push out new task versions and push the push two different image tags that I think actually hopefully Docker has fixed. Um, but each service basically had its own little deploy thing that it was registered with ECS and then for every for every commit to develop, uh, it went to a staging cluster and then also tagged the the image with the SHA of that commit and with that circle build. So what the end result for us was that you could tie, you could tie each task definition back to the task definition, to the circle CI build, to the specific commit SHA on GitHub. Um, so we were using circle through that. I was pretty happy. Um, 
a bunch of a bunch of other tools out there. Um, there's also the internal Amazon tools, so it is definitely possible to do a cool continuous integration, continuous deployment architecture uh, with just through Amazon's Code Star suite. So Code Build, Code Pipeline, Code Deploy. Um, it's really it's since the kind of the introduction of ECR, it's gotten it's gotten easier on ECS also, which is really cool. Um, Cause I don't really have to worry about um, authenticating with the registry. I can just use the, I can just use IAM roles to talk from my cluster right to my, right to my registry. Mm -hmm. do, do you think, do you think people uh, are mostly end up uh, using the native uh, task definition JSON and checking that into Git or do they kind of go into, into the um, task definitions in the API and update those? I mean, what did you do in the, in the, uh, so I did the API. Um, right. So you didn't check a, check a JSON in. It was like all in the API initially. So I registered the new one with the the task definition itself. So like the structure of the task definition was checked into GitHub. But updating updating the uh, updating the new task definition every time was an API call. Um, if that makes sense. Um, but I think. But the, the messiest part of that for us, which I think has been solved now, or there are, there are more elegant ways to deal with it, um, was it's always, it always comes down to secret environment variables. So like, where are you keeping them and how can your task definition get to them? Um, so I would love to play around, I think, a little bit more um, uh, with using uh, like, the, like the parameter store so that I could, so you could end up removing a bunch of the kind of the funky environment variable stuff from your task definitions, which would be cool. Um, you could do it both ways. I definitely, I'm always a big API person, I guess. Um, but I think as long as you're, you're putting your tasks in version control somehow, I think being able to know infrastructure is code, right? Just like any other code. So, uh, it's really hugely valuable to keep things like container definitions and task definitions and some sort of version control, whichever floats your boat. Um, but it's really cool to be able to kind of roll that back also and be like, oh, well, you know, this task stopped working when I changed this environment variable or I changed this configuration value and now my performance has gone down. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I asked because we, we're looking to to integrate uh, V Flux with ECS, which is which is in our GitHub and maybe something you could chat about later on. Uh, if that's something that that interests you personally, sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We have another question. Um, how do you get performance measures and general logging centralized in ECS? So, the easiest way to look at centralized logging on ECS is going to be through CloudWatch. Um, so, uh, there's also so they actually they didn't we didn't have this when I was when I got started with ECS. So I started using ECS as a beta user um, and it still consistently blows my mind when I go in and see things like a first run wizard where it like walks you through all this stuff. I'm like, wow, I had to look at the documentation for so long to make that happen. Um, so, but so the easiest way is going to be through CloudWatch. Um, there's a new, there's a native log driver now in ECS also. So there's two parts to this question. So the first one is the, you can use uh, AWS logs as a log driver now. So rather, rather than kind of worry about log collection, you can just throw it at CloudWatch. Uh, you can separate it out, CloudWatch. Uh, ECS also separates, puts cluster metrics there. So you can see the resource usages for both your services and for the cluster itself. Um, you can see that both from the ECS dashboard and then also, uh, also from CloudWatch itself. Um, as for like, as for application logging, uh, we use Sumo Logic. Uh, so this goes back to my view on containers as databases, which is that they aren't. Um, but the way that I did logging was that I threw everything at the at the actual host. So what a problem that we ran into when we were first kind of trying to decompose this big monolith was that. Uh, sometimes our containers would fail to start up so quickly that we had no meaningful logs or that there would be a problem with the container itself, but I wanted to know what the actual problem with the container itself was. Um, so rather than store the logs in the container and send the logs from the container somewhere else, um, we basically dumped everything back to var log messages on the actual cluster host. 
Um, and then from there, we ran, uh, we ran our Sumo Logic data collector that would scoop up everything from var log messages. Uh, and Sumo Logic does something kind of cool, just they, they do a good job parsing out logs. So we just would tag things with the services that it came from, and we would separate it all out on the Sumo Logic side. Um, I believe in my absence, we're now using something called honeycomb.io, which is also cool. Um, but ultimately, I would take all the application logs from each container and that I would dump them all back as fast as they were written to, to var log messages on the host, and then my host would send them all up to Sumo Logic. So that meant that I got container logging faster so that I didn't have to worry about whether my container failed before it started sending logs to Sumo Logic, which would be tragic for me. Um, but I also didn't care whether the cluster host itself stayed, along, stayed around that long because all it was doing was shipping its logs back up to Sumo Logic. So I think this still fits my earlier philosophy of don't keep it in the container if you care about it for later. Don't keep it on the cluster host if you care about it for later, but put it somewhere that's designed to have resiliency and storage for that kind of data. So in our case, it was sending them off to a different logger. Are there any precautions to take when setting up containers, et cetera, to use a lot of, utilize AZ failover? Yeah. Um, so this is, this I think goes back to, can, there are some things where you want to think about your container-based ar architecture just like you would any other architecture. So you wouldn't set up, you, want, you always want resiliency, you always want redundancy, and that applies to containers too. So I would probably, in no, in no circumstances, unless it was a service that I literally did not care about, um, I would not set up a service that I only ran one copy of. I like to write services so that you can spin up multiple copies of them, and it shouldn't matter how many I have as long as I have more than two, because I should be able to scale up and down to meet traffic. So there's, there's a couple benefits to that. So one, it means that I can scale up only the services that I need. So if I have a, I have a messaging service that gets a lot of traffic, I should be able to scale that up and down by itself and not have to scale up like my internal admin dashboard all the time uh, in order, like this, this shouldn't be paired at all. So part of having the multiple containers though is that yeah, they should be distributed, they should be distributed between availability zones. Um, so there's a, there's something in ECS now, it's called a task placement policies and strategies. So you can choose how your tasks are distributed uh, by the scheduler and the default one there is a spread. Um, so I can I spread my tasks as they spin up between availability zones. So if I run a task that's like messaging service and I run two copies of it, it won't start those two copies all in US East 1 it'll st US East 1E or 1A, it'll start them in US East 1B and US East 1D. Um, you know what I mean? And then there's a second thing there, which is part of the, the ECS deployments. Um, I feel like everywhere I talk, by the way, I, end I just end up talking about ECS. Um, so I think I'm going to change my title to be Chief ECS Evangelist. Um, uh, part of the deployment process in ECS is that you you it has like rolling deployments by default so when you're when you're deploying something uh so if you've worked with load balancers before in aws you know there's a concept of connection draining so i don't terminate connections abruptly from a load balancer i let them kind of go off gracefully so if you're still in the process of talking to a service through a load balancer i'm not just going to shut you off and kick you to the wind. I'm going to give like 300 seconds or something to kind of gracefully take the traffic down. Uh, same thing applies in ECS. So when I deploy a new task revision, um, I'm not starting off the new one until the old, until the, I'm not killing off the old task definitions until the new one has passed health checks. So if I have a couple copies of the container running, um, I'm not going to terminate those old ones until my new ones have come up. So you want to have redundancy for failover in a, in, a, in a couple places. So one, you want your default spread to always be, I have at least two copies of this service run, of this task definition running. Um, and I want those, those two or more copies to be distributed between availability zones. Um, but also like ECS will kind of help you a little bit also. So distribute them on your own, but then also ECS will kind of babysit a little bit and it will make sure that you pass health checks before it deploys a new copy. So a couple different, a couple different levels in there to, to make sure you stay safe. 
Great. Thank you so much. And thanks yeah. everybody for your many, many questions. Uh, it seems like, I mean, obviously there are so many users and, and there's a lot of areas for growing. So thanks very much for answering all those questions. I love questions. Happy to have them. If you guys have more follow questions, you can, uh, you can tweet me. I usually answer them when I, yeah. So cool. cool. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Jane. By the way, thank you, Abby, for a really awesome talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for coming along. Thanks for having me. It was tons of fun. And I will see everyone in, in four weeks. Um, and if not, just tweet me in the meantime. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. See, I just wanted to take this opportunity to tell people a little, little bit about what we do in, uh, uh, at, Weave, at Weave in terms of our product, Weave Cloud. Um, uh, as Abby mentioned in uh, her talk, um, microservices are taking off in a very big way, and increasingly people, uh, companies of all sizes and organizations of all sizes are, are looking at microservices as a way of, of becoming more scalable and, uh, and, and moving faster. Um, and so Weave Cloud is a set of tools uh, which allow you to um, plug uh, our tooling into uh, your orchestration framework. Um, we currently have deep integration with Kubernetes. Uh, we're also working, but we do have some integration with other orchestration frameworks like ECS, for example. Um, and uh, some of our tools work with anything running Docker. So, so I'll highlight that as, as we go through. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is, is, is really about um, how microservices allow you to go around this loop faster. So the diagram here, if you can, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, the diagram here is all about taking an application, which is uh, perhaps developed locally, um, pushing code changes uh, through a CI pipeline uh, in order to build and then test uh, Docker images or Docker containers, or really the images that, that then instantiate into containers. Um, having those images uh, pushed into um, through a CI pipeline and then deployed um, into a cluster. Uh, so the first piece of Weave Cloud, which is shown by this dotted line here, um, is about taking those container images and pushing those, automatically deploying them into a cluster. And then being able to monitor that application while it's running. So this arrow here is about being able to take metrics and getting visibility into um, uh, into applications that you're running um, in production. And um, then really these, this loop around here is about being able to say, well, um, so maybe there's a problem in production. Maybe, maybe, I, uh, uh, maybe I deployed a version of my code which, um, which bumps, uh, which, which when you deploy it results in uh, higher latencies, for example, on one of my services. So being able to take information about that and, and use it, for example, to say, OK, well, I'm going to roll back to the previous version. Um, and so it's all about uh, being able to go faster. Um, it's all about being able to uh, ship features faster by deploying things continuously uh, and deploying small microservices uh, in teams, like Abby mentioned in, uh, in, in Conway's, with respect to Conway's law. Um, and, and then also being able to identify problems faster and then uh, result in, in, in changing things faster by, by going around this loop. So, so Weave helps uh, DevOps teams iterate faster with observability and monitoring, uh, continuous delivery, uh, container networks and firewalls. So um, container networks and firewalls is something I haven't talked about yet. Um, that includes uh, a tool called WeaveNet, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, I wanted to take a second to, uh, to talk about the target audience um, for this. Um, and so I've got, got a slide in here where I, I, I searched for uh, like picture of programmer on the internet and the only non-stock um, uh, photograph I could find was, was this picture of uh, this guy sitting in front of a computer in an office in Sweden. And so we decided to craft our entire um, uh, sort of primary persona for the product around uh, uh, Bjorn, who works in a Swedish web agency. Um, and, and so the idea is that, uh, that, that developers working in teams um, uh, are increasingly dividing up um, into DevOps teams, 
uh, where there's a group of people who work on a microservice and, and uh, perhaps a, a, a DevOps engineer who's responsible for the deployment of that microservice, or maybe everyone is responsible for that deployment. Um, and so in this sort of hypothetical world of, of Bjorn and uh, the Swedish web agency, they might have um, several different teams working on uh, a sock shop um, for a big client. That sock shop itself might be broken up into lots of different pieces. And uh, Bjorn perhaps is responsible for deployment and, and, and developing and the, and the team that's developing the front end. Um, so when you're setting up these services, uh, that's when um, the tools in Weave Cloud really come in handy. Um, it's, it's, it's about being able to set up a CI pipeline and a deployment pipeline, and then also set up a standardized way of doing um, uh, visualization and monitoring to understand what's going on inside your app. Um, so uh, when we started talking about developing uh, these tools, uh, one of the big problems that we found was that um, there really aren't any very good uh, sample applications for microservices. There's lots of like reasonable sample apps for individual like Python or Ruby or Node projects, um, but there really weren't any good examples of the kind of um, approach that, that teams are taking with microservices sort of available as a, as a stock uh, sort of off the shelf application. And so we decided to develop the sock shop and um, the interesting thing about the sock shop is that it itself is divided up into uh, lots of lots of little pieces. Um, so um, the um, uh, what we're seeing here on the screen is an example of Weave Scope. Um, and uh, I noticed, by the way, Pradeep's question. Um, uh, Ilya, if you want to answer that question in the chat, that's fine, or I can come back to it at the end of the talk. Um, so, I'm answering it. Okay, cool. That's great. Um, so, uh, so what we can see in this diagram here is that we've got um, Weave Scope, and Weave Scope has given us a view into what's going on inside this shop. So, um, so the sock shop is is just an online shop. Um, if you were to scroll down, you could pick some socks and add them to your basket. You could log in and, and go and check out. Um, and what's going on underneath the hood here is that um, requests are coming in from the internet. They're going into a, a router, they're going into the front end, and then those requests are getting, uh, and then the front end is making API requests to, uh, for example, the order service um, and the catalog. And each of these things are separate services that are exposed as separate containers or sets of containers. Um, and in this way, uh, Scope is dynamically showing you the um, connections between all of those things. Um, and it's building up this sort of map of your containers um, in real time and, and showing it to you. Um, and the whole reason that we're doing this is, as I said, so that um, because containers and microservices allow you to deliver more rapidly. Um, when, uh, so let's take an example of that. Suppose that there's a four person team working on the orders service um, and now, uh, that team doesn't have to synchronize with the other teams in the company um, in order to release updates to the order service. Uh, they can just release updates to the order service whenever they like. And because the order service, as Abby mentioned, exposes a REST API, as long as there's some level of backward compatibility in new, new versions to that REST API, uh, the front end can carry on speaking uh, to the order service even when the order service is upgraded. The order service can then expose new API methods that a newer version of the front end can then consume. Um, and so it's about sort of having these things loosely coupled. And so just to reiterate, scope is a way of visualizing those things. So I, I'd encourage you to go and check it out. Um, so I've just got a couple of uh, sort of slightly lower level architecture diagrams here. So, um, uh, and I'll take you through the different pieces in Weave Cloud as well, because scope is actually just one of those pieces. Um, so in this diagram, we've got Weave Cloud here up in the middle, uh, which, by the way, we host on AWS ourselves. Um, and we've got the application uh, that's being developed on developer's laptop. Um, the, you can use Scope both in your laptop environment and in your production environment uh, to push the same metrics uh, up to Weave Cloud. Um, and you can use it to consistently verify and troubleshoot. 
Um, and like I showed you earlier, the UI looks a little bit like this. It's the explore tab inside Weave Cloud. Uh, then we've also got a deploy uh, tab um, in Weave Cloud, which allows you to automatically um, uh, observe changes to a CI, the output of a CI system. So automatically observe new containers showing up in a Docker registry and push that config uh, both into version control and into production. Um, and that UI looks a little bit like this. There are buttons for different releases, and you can roll back releases. And, uh, in this example, it's automated. And then finally, we've gone all in on Prometheus as a mechanism for monitoring your application, your application, your network, and your orchestrator. And that pushes metrics into Weave Cloud. Uh, and um, that monitoring looks a little bit like this. So inside Weave Cloud, there's a monitoring tab that you can uh, click. Um, and then you can put PromQL queries in there. Um, and then finally, you can secure your application by defining network policy. And uh, this works um, especially well with Kubernetes and uh, allows you to say A can talk to B, but not to C. Um, so that's all I've got. Um, I also just wanted to mention uh, that we have a bunch of other talks and trainings uh, coming up on going into these topics in much more detail. So for example, we have uh, talks and trainings on Kubernetes 101. Uh, we have talks and trainings on continuous delivery, that is hooking up your CI CD pipeline. Uh, and then uh, monitoring, like how do you actually monitor this stuff once it's deployed? And then finally, how to set up network policy and security. So uh, I would beseech you, if you haven't already, to join our meetup group at meetup.com slash pro slash weave. Uh, and that's it. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, please ask any questions. Oh, and so we're hiring. Yes, and we're hiring in all our cities.